Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the one of the two opening session of the Vienna Humanities Festival uh, 2023. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here, and thank you uh, all for coming. We have an absolutely cracking opening conversation with uh, <laughs> Professor Richard Burke. Um, uh, and we're going to be touching on some contemporary issues, some historical issues, but also where his historical and contemporary issues, issues uh, meet. So um, at a time when truth seems as, as volatile as ever, plunging back in history to analyze how societies interpreted a specific occurrence or how a philosophical idea was generated and received by contemporaries uh, can be risky sometimes, if not occasionally uh, reckless. Nonetheless, understanding political concepts such as progress or justness within the environment where they were first produced is an enlightening exercise, I believe, as it grants us an enlarged perspective on what should be considered historically accurate. Well, uh, as, I, as I said, with me here to guide us through the birth, transformation and, and death of some key ideas that have shaped political philosophy in order to assess the uh, ever complex tension between established truths of the past and mutating circumstances of the present is the Cambridge Professor of History of Political Thought, Richard Burke. Richard, welcome. Um, Richard was educated at University College Dublin, UCD, before completing his doctorate at Cambridge. And if this wasn't enough, he then took a second undergraduate degree in classics at Birkbeck. Um, <clears throat> he has taught uh, at UCD uh, before being appointed professor at the History Department of Queen Mary University in London. And then in 2018, he was elected to the chair in the History of Political Thought at Cambridge. Uh, his work has uh, attracted various accolades and uh, awards, including uh, being joint winner of the Istvan Hunt Memorial Book Prize in Intellectual History. And he has a number of fellowships in Europe and the United States, including now, I'm glad to say, here at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. Welcome to the IVM, uh, Richard. So I first learned of uh, your work when I read the volume of essays, as I think you know, that you, you co-edited on the, the history of Ireland, which was an immensely insightful uh, read from, from various perspectives. But you've also written extensively on, on Edmund Burke, and we're now eagerly awaiting copies, not just the publication, but copies of your book, Hegel's World Revolutions. Uh, which Princeton is about to uh, publish um, at the end of Aug at the end of October, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's start our conversation in in the present, Richard. A present that's characterised, one might argue, by turmoil, anxiety, uncertainty, but also by a, a lack of political or ideological uh, clarity. So. So let me start by paraphrasing Gam Gramsci to ask you whether we're looking at the corpse of the old world and still waiting for the new one to be born. Is that where we are at the moment? Well, I think um, uncertainty and turmoil is a condition of human social and political life. So, so I don't think that's a great transformation in our era. Um, although there are particular... Um, Areas of disorientation, um, you know, is Russia a threat or a declining power? Um, is um, uh, rapprochement with China con conceivable, never mind possible? Um, is the European Union in longer term crisis? Are, are the uh, economies of the, of, the, of the West, do they invite only disappointment and despair? Um, so this is indeed... Um, you know, a question about where we are. But I don't feel the disorientation is particularly uh, discombobulating by comparison with, with any other era. Um, are we entering a new world and, um, uh, or, or just living in a dying one? Um, I don't think that we're in an epoch of extraordinary uh, transition compared to other uh, 
world historical transitions, um, although I, I think there is a key international polarity, China and the West, um, which is genuinely perplexing. I'm not sure how perplexing all the rest is, but by comparison with, with normality, with, with, you know, in other words, it's, 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 it's a routine of crisis rather than uh, an exceptional crisis, it seems to me. Right. Oh, um, so that's actually quite encouraging, I suppose. But in terms of, in terms of that, what I mentioned about the ideological un, un, uncertainty, so, you know, obviously the... Uh, Givens of the Cold War, mm. uh, the struggle between capitalism and communism, that has largely, it seems to me, receded. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything identifiable in place today? Well, uh, I think there is a bipolarity. I mean, I think uh, on the assumption that, you know, Russia is a relatively world historically spent force, that doesn't mean it can't do enormous damage, and it doesn't mean that... Um, the worst couldn't happen, of course it could, there's no ruling these things out. But broadly speaking, it seems to be in its um, twilight by comparison with, you know, 1960. Um, but I think the relations between China and um, the United States over the next 20 years are definitely troubling. Um, I don't think China is planning to become like Europe. I mean, I think it feels it's got a competitor ideology and plans to win with it. I mean, that's party policy. Um, so that is potentially certainly alarming. I, mean, I have no doubt about that. So that is a new, um, you know, Cold War. Not icy, but it's, um, it's getting chillier, I would say. Uh, except, of course, the, uh, the, the one difference perhaps being that the Chinese economy and uh, the economies of the West are much more intertwined and For integrated sure. than was the case during the, the yes. original Yes, but the, War. but the ideological polarity is intense, and it could drive uh, an economic partition, I would say. Yeah. But I don't, we're not confused about this, I don't think. I think we know it's there, we just don't know uh, how large the threat is, because we don't know what the military ambitions of China are. And we don't know whether, um, with the advance of its economy, its need for growth, and so on and so forth, whether there is the possibility of liberalization. This was the expectation, sort of, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but and indeed, for many years, it looked as though yes. that was the path they were going yes. down, and then this yes. sudden sort of now, right? reversal. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I would call that not massive, I wouldn't call that wildly disorientating, but it is certainly weighing. Um, I think we can, I think any, everyone in this room is going to, you know, there may not be a side-picking type of person, but basically all picking the same side, which is the United States in this contest. They don't want to live under an unaccountable dictatorship. But just as an as aside on this, so if we, if we look at the last 30 years of, of globalization, which is uh, in, its, uh, in its appearance in the last... 30 years was a new phenomenon and quite an intense phenomenon. Nonetheless, it seems to me that uh, the nation state, a form of 19th century nationalism combined with the sort of nationalist intolerance of the 20th century has remained pretty persistent. I mean, you know, the persistence of the uh, ancient regimes, as it yes. were, during that period of, yes. of globalization. Well, there's been um, economic and financial globalization. There's absolutely no political globalization, and there won't be for any foreseeable future, if indeed ever. And would one even want it? I mean, obviously one will want more commodious forms of interaction, more agreeable forms of interaction, but, uh, um, yeah, globalization has not... Um, been accompanied by a decline in nationalism, and it would be, I think, unrealist, unrealistic to expect it. That to happen. Uh, and and is, it is, is it that politics, uh, the, the politics of the nation state and nationalism, which is, has eroded the financial and economic globalization, or was it intrinsic failure of the financial and, uh, financial and economic globalization? Um, I just think that there are two forces pulling in contrary directions, which is to say domestic politics are domestic. The allegiance of domestic populations is a, a national allegiance, uh, but nonetheless, from a certain perspective, certain forms of globalization are perceived, especially 
from the, on the part of some parties to be um, nationally advantageous. Uh, but these, you know, in relation to um, the movement of capital, movement of populations, uh, these have, uh, you know, complex impacts on domestic economies and national politics. So it's just a, it's kind of not a collision, but it's a tension. Mm. I mean, one thing I've, one thing I've uh, uh, noticed is that, say, since 2008, since after the financial crisis, we've had again an accelerating polarization in societies uh, across the world, but always refracted through local cultural conditions, so that if, for example, you try to explain a, to a Brazilian uh, about the sort of intricacies of Brexit, mm. uh, it would leave them utterly baffled, just as Brits would probably be baffled about uh, why Jair <laughs> Bolsonaro, who for 25 years was an utterly insignificant senator, suddenly became the most yes. powerful man in, in Brazil. What is it about the fact... It, is there a... Is this a new phenomenon whereby we appear all to be experiencing the same social trajectories and yet cannot see beyond the boundaries of our own trajectory? Yes. Um, are we experiencing the same trajectories in all if these If you places? look at sort of Trump, if you look at what's happening in, in oh, okay. Europe, Modi is you, arguably... Uh, Modi's India, Erdogan, you're... You're, you're seeing people being asked to choose for sure one way or the other, as it yes, were. Yes, yes. Well, I think those pressures... I mean, that's a populism question. Yes, it I, is. I th yes. <laughs> I think those um, pressures have always been intrinsic to democracies. You know, now they flourish in one guise, another time they appear in another, which is to say uh, democracies are both constitutional structures and they're... Um, electorally accountable structures, so they're both um, popular and non-popular. I mean, constitutionalism is a mechanism for cutting across a popular will. So uh, post-war constitutional democracies have these two component um, parts, and um, it's unusual to see them, um, these two rival parts, um, in collision in the United States, uh, but in various countries in the Western world since 1945, it's still been evident that there are popular forces and there um, are, as it were, as I said, constitutionalist forces. I think, you know, may maybe these two have been less evident in Germany um, uh, up until very recently with the AfD, um, but um, that's because it's a paranoically constitutionally co constitutional culture because it had a supreme populism. Uh, this, you know, the most extraordinary version of the 20th century. But in the end, democracies are accountable to populations. Populations are going to be swayed by, you know, um, uh, the kind of, you know, appeals can be made to a population's, as it were, worst instincts. That that is always available. And um, on and off, this seems to have, to me to have been a feature of politics since mass democratization. But but of course, I can see that, you know. Um, Hungary together with Italy um, and, uh, and now the United States and, of course, as you said, Brazil and uh, India. Yes, there does seem to be um, an alignment of, you know, a sort of um, international alignment of the constitutional powers versus the populist powers. I, I do see that. But as I said, I don't think it's a, a, a complete transformation. I think these are latent possibilities. And... Um if we look at it in the 1990s, there was this surge in the popularity of democracies yes. around the world. Suddenly everyone wanted to get onto the democratic bandwagon. Yeah. How successfully or unsuccessfully they were doing it, how genuinely, how ungenuinely is, is up for debate. But certainly that appeared to be a dominating ideology. And really since then, since the 2000s, we've seen a, a, a pushback on that. Do you think democracies are fundamentally in retreat or this is just a, a predictable ebb, ebb and flow? Um, the latter, I would say. I mean, fundamentally in retreat seems to me um, unlikely. One, because um, uh, the, it's, it's, it's extremes that are possible. I mean, either you have 
um, a regime based on representation, accountability, and circulation of parties, right? I mean, as someone said, um, a, a democracy is a state in which parties lose elections. Um, either you have such a structure or basically you've got some species of dictatorship. And I think m most clear-sighted populations don't want the latter. So I don't think it's in decline. However, I do think, um, you know, modern democracies um, are the products of various forms of compromise. Um, they're comp composed of sort of a combination of forces. Um, these are not predetermined to peacefully coexist. So there's always a threat within any constitutional form. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I don't see any grounds for um, hysteric, hysterical despair quite yet. Good. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that's I, a high I, bar. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take you back now to, uh, to 1989 and uh, to go back to what is now really a cliche, and that's the end of history, yes. Fukuyama's uh, uh, essay and, and, and then book, which are you know, actually rather two different, two different yeah. entities. Um, given what's happened since 1989, was this article merely a sort of gimmicky, perhaps inaccurate observation about the, the end of history, or was he arguing something much more profound? And if he was arguing something more profound, what was it? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to be um, clairvoyant, and it's hard to say anything very intelligent in the face of the future. So it's easy to ridicule. What I'm saying is it's easy to ridicule Fukuyama, but I think... Um, the, the Fukuyama thesis has actually been simplified in popular consciousness, and it, it's not a stupid point he was making. Um, he was saying um, that a certain form of struggle in world history was over. Um, his argument was inspired by Hegel, who's reputed to have said that history's now come to an end. It's not exactly what um, Hegel said, it has, has to be clarified. Um, Hegel had, um, since this is what I've most recently been working on, um, I should say, um, Hegel had a comprehensive world historical view. So he wasn't interested in today and yesterday. He was interested in ancient China, India, um, Persia, Egypt, Greece, Rome, Christianity, transition from uh, Judaism to Christianity, feudalism, modern constitutional republics. So that, that's the trajectory. Big, big picture. Yeah. So, so <laughs> he did believe that there were an irreversible change had taken place within a world historical frame. And it seems to me this is not a mad thought, but actually a correct thought, that um, prior to, broadly speaking, you know, um, you know the post-Christian, neo-Christian constitutional Europe of the... Enlightenment, 17th, 18th century. Um, something extraordinary had happened, uh, which was that, um, broadly speaking, it was accepted as a fundamental norm of human social organization that there was one category of human being. In other words, as his phrase had it, all are free. In other words, there's no um, class of um, slave subject or no um, viable caste structure. Th this is over. We all now realize that we are fundamentally share a characteristic, which is the characteristic of being a human being. Now, the point is, this is a world historical exception. This wasn't applicable in ancient China or Egypt or Greece or Rome, um, which were, of course, um, the latter two slave-owning societies. So the very idea that no one is a slave is a, an epochal transformation in consciousness, he believed. Um, and so, um, you know, something totally had changed such that the end of the fundamental struggle of history to show that humans are human, that's now over. Hegel, by that, did not mean, I'll get back to Fukuyama, but mm. Fukuyama is a quasi-neo-Hegelian. Mm. Um, that did not mean that um, there would be no more struggle. In fact, Hegel in you know, the 1820s, died in 1831, Hegel in the 1820s was saying, I spent my whole life oscillating between hope and despair. You know, he's a post-revolutionary thinker, post-1789 thinker. So actually, he was much like us in the beginning of your questions. He was in a state of oscillation between hope and despair. So given that, it was not um, a happy, clappy, 
we now, you know, pack up and, you know, <laughs> um, it's not a kumbaya moment, to, yeah. to use your phrase. So, um, um, so that is the Hegelian perspective, and it seems to me not at all mad, but broadly speaking correct. Um, of course, there's a great um, problem with Hegelianism, which is, of course, 1933 to 45, but because there was, on that vision, two classes of human being, in fact, maybe several classes of human being. So there is that problem with, you know, say, 20th century Hegelianism. But, but, but nonetheless, that was the vision, and it's not mad, uh, because post-45, we all still think it's true, right? Um, but Fukuyama was a simplification of this, uh, and basically believing that um, the struggle between East and West was over, that liberal democracy had triumphed, uh, and that therefore the curtain could come down. That's clearly a simplification. That there's a thing as the triumph of uh, liberal democracy, struggle about what the meaning of liberal democracy um, goes on. Um, but I suppose um, one would still want to say um, clear sighted populations won't vote for slavery, they won't vote for dictatorship. It doesn't mean it won't happen, but I'm just saying, you know, there's an achievement of a certain kind of consensus, say in the West, on which people don't want to backpedal. Um, that doesn't mean the Fukuyama model is correct, uh, but I think his vision was simplified whilst it itself was a little bit simplifying. I mm. think, so that's a long answer because there was a vista no, no, there. No, okay, no, it's always, it's always it, what struck me about the, about the essay, mm -hmm. <coughs> which I went back to a, a couple of years ago, was that it was published at the end of January, beginning of February, 1989. And things were already cooking in Eastern Europe one way or another. Yep. But he doesn't actually mention anything about Eastern Europe at all. I yes. mean, it's a much broader view. Yes. than the, It's almost an unhappy coincidence that 89 happened when he, you know, eight months after, I mean, it's in its fullness, eight months after he published that article, was that article was immediately reinterpreted and I think fundamentally misunderstood. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, go, so the uh, Hegelian, uh, the, that Hegelian moment, and going back to, uh, I really want to get into Hegel because he's such an influential thinker, and mm -hmm. yet one which I think people struggle to uh, struggle to understand often. Um, Hegel was part of the young group in Jena of scholars, thinkers, writers in the, the, the 1790s, who were under the sort of benign tutor, tutorship of, of uh, Goethe and the slightly more grumpy influence of Schiller. Um, how much did that extraordinary revolution of the, the German Romanticism impact on, on Hegel and his thinking? Uh, massively. Two revolutions happened um, in uh, 1789 and the 1790s in, um, in, in Europe. Uh, one is obviously the French Revolution. The other, as far as everyone was concerned in the German-speaking lands, was the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Uh, there's no doubt about this. This had a massive impact um, on um, you know, philosophical perspectives in the world. A, because it was a challenge to uh, religion, a challenge to various forms of, of authority, and an attempt to ground human morality in individual rational judgment. But, but the point is, you don't ask the priest, you don't ask the state, its autonomy is, in other words, the, the giving yourself moral rules is the foundation of um, human value. So there's no, there's no value in the sky, there's no value in the state, it's about um, self-given um, norms. Well, this is enormously um, transformative, uh, for instance, in, authoritarian, in an authoritarian state such as, such as Prussia was, not to mention other parts of, uh, of um, Germany. So, so Kant had a huge impact upon a whole generation, including the German Romantics, um, who transformed Kantianism in various ways, but it was nonetheless a sort of vision of... Um, its value was freedom. I mean, free subjectivity was the, was the guiding value. And um, Hegel, who comes from, um, you know, southern Germany, um, was, um, and moved later in his career um, from Tübingen, then through various positions and places, ultimately ending up in Jena also, uh, was also um, living the slipstream of Kantianism, 
and Romanticism, though he was a, a critic of the, the Romantics, in particular because he saw them as um, a sort of ungovernable uh, version of free expressive subjectivity. So in a way, if you wanted an analogy, I mean, I shouldn't be using, as an historian, I shouldn't be using these flabby analogies, but it's a bit like the 60s, it's a bit like the 60s, you know. In other words, self-expression became uh, a, a core value. Now, um, so Hegel is indeed influenced by this, this, um, this culture, but he, he got, becomes a critic specifically of the German Romantics, and, but he is himself writing his, his first great work, The Phenomenology, in Jena, um, during the period of the Napoleonic conquest. I mean, it's, 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 it appears just in 1807, so a year after um, the Battle of um, yeah, Auerstadt. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Auerstadt, yeah. Um, and so how does, uh, how does his thinking turn away from uh, those heady days of the, of the German romantics? Which, what specifically is he, is he criticizing? He's criticizing the idea, I mean, you might call it, you might say, I mean, to use a sort of contemporary language, he's a critic of romantic individualism. That's to say, he's a critic of, as we, as we might put it, you know, in America, he's a critic of sort of self-referential rights discourse, you know, me-ishness, um, my rights, my identity. Okay, so he felt that um, the Kantian value of autonomy had given rise to a self-expressive individualism, that this was a sort of cha potential chaos of individual self-adulation. I mean, identitarianism is not unlike it. I mean, my, the, the micro-sensitivities of my identity. He, he thought this culture could spin out of control and that any, um, that morality, of course, should be centered in um, the, the values of individuality as opposed to church and state. That was the case. But nonetheless, values should be anchored in what he calls Zittlichkeit. Um, that's to say, in the wider culture, we might just say. Um, that's to say, we, we get our values from our culture. We don't just invent them. We should um, plot our, our way forward in, in dialogue with our inherited values, which are not all just to be discarded as junk. Um, so, I mean, he's a dialectical thinker in that technical sense, that um, moving forward is a process of um, um, overcoming the conditions in which you're living, but also um, preserving elements as you go forward. So it's a sort of preserving and um, improving and advancing vision all at once. Uh, yeah. And how did, how, how did those momentous events, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars, did, uh, uh, what sort of an impact on his thinking did that have? Because that must have been a sort of you know, massive obsession of his as it was all going on as he was developing the ideas. Totally massive. Um, America was a uh, small, small fry, of course. It was a, 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 M M Mickey Mouse um, settlements across the Atlantic with uh, uh, three million people. I mean, it's not a serious player. So none that's something that happened there. It was important to the British Empire, but not so enormous on, on the global stage, although he was interested in the extent to which America represented a future or not. I leave that to one side because it was not a dominating event for him. The French Revolution was, because that, um, to use your, your Gramscian vision, that seemed to be very much a moment of sloughing off the past and a, you know, a whole new, um, a whole new uh, sort of sun rising in the sky, basically. It was a metaphor he used himself. Um, so a, a rebirth and a, a new dawn. Um, uh, that was the case because um, basically... Um, the idea that human beings were going to be subject to a politics of their own creation, which would be answerable to them, let's just put it in those broad terms, was now an inescapable, an inescapable fact of history which no one um, would be able to successfully abandon. However, despite um, appearances, he was actually incredibly critical of the French Revolution and thought it was basically a dog's breakfast. Um, and it's not just that he thought 1792, 93 was a sort of spinning off the, a sp spinning off the correct track. He actually thought it, it went horribly wrong from the get-go. So, so the vision of um, living in a representative constitutional regime, yes, that's correct. But the French, um, um, you know, 
uh, came up with an unfortunate version of where they were seeking to get already by July 89. That's to say, they couldn't organize um, any species of constitutional coherence to save them. Uh, this is not a stupid point on Hegel's part. He just believed that they couldn't organize relations between executive and legislative power, which is indeed correct. I mean, was the National Assembly a legislative power or an executive power? If it was both together, there was simply no separation of power, so there's nothing very agreeable about that. Um, if, it's, if it's legislative, why aren't you letting the, the Crown execute? Why can't you agree how the Crown might execute? So basically, there was, a con there was a constitutional revolution and implosion at the same time, and then a struggle which lasted for a century, basically. I mean, the revolution doesn't end in 93 or, or 99 or 1815 or, or, or 48 or, or maybe 72. So it's a, it's a long trajectory in which the various forces of the state, which are thrown into contention in 89, don't achieve um, reconciliation. So I think he, he, he was early in seeing that this was, um, although he celebrated what we might call the values of um, whatever about fraternity, certainly uh, liberty and equality, he celebrated those values, but what do they mean and how do we orchestrate them? He thought that had been highly uh, problematic. And did he, did, did, uh, uh, when Napoleon comes to power and begins his, his wars, of, wars of conquest, yeah. does he see in the Levee en masse uh, the creation of this citizen's army and uh, a much more national-focused military campaign? Does he, does he see, perceive something new in that? Well, um, so in 1790, he's 20. Um, and he's in a theological seminary in Tübingen. Um, so he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a kid, and he's not in France. Oh, not a 20, he's not a kid, but he's young, and he's not in France. We've no record from then um, as to what exactly he thought, so we don't really begin to get records until 92, by which time we know he's, um, he's, um, he's, 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 he's a non-Jacobin. We, we know that much. Um, so the levé en masse... Um, he would have known by the period in which Napoleon was making an impact in Germany, um, especially um, in around about 1806 when Germany was kind of finished. <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, uh, from that moment on, also, he knew there was a Prussian, although he's not a Prussian, um, although he did, he did obviously end up in the University of Berlin, you know, in the later part of the, of the teens. Um, he did know, nonetheless, that there was, a, I suppose, a rise in... Um, Prussian national affiliation. I mean, it's, it's then that self-consciously the University of Berlin is founded. I mean, this is a, you know, if we, if we can't have a state, at least we can have some learning of our own, was the sort of, uh, was the thought. So there was a sort of um, rise of sort of German nationalism. It's not exactly nationalism because it wasn't state-centric, so no. it's actually a misnomer. Mm. Uh, but this is when Fichte wrote his addresses to the German mm. nation. It's when a sort of feeling of um, the importance of German culture, you might just put it that way, emerged, and he was certainly aware of that. He did not support mass politics, though, by the way. He supported, supported a, I mean, later on when he's writing about politics, he supported a representative regime, um, but that's not uh, with a comprehensive, with comprehensive manhood suffrage. He didn't have a very high view of women either, so they certainly wouldn't be getting <laughs> votes, just incidentally. Um, you know, so many of his contemporaries were rather more feminist than he was. Um, he didn't, for instance, think women could be philosophers. They could try, they were trying, but he believed they didn't quite succeed. So his views were his views. Um, uh, so not an, he was not a, not a supporter of mass participation, but rather um, a representative constitutional regime. And, and just finally, how is he perceiving the uh, beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in, in, in Britain at that point? Um, well, he studied um, the Scottish Enlightenment very closely. I mean, European culture at the time, I mean, if you look at modern scholarship uh, um, in relation to, say, German intellectual culture, it's all very Germanocentric, as if the Germans only read Germans. This is an enormous mistake. Um, they were immersed in French culture and immersed in British culture. And Hegel in particular studied, of course, the French, um, of which he wasn't enamored, um, and, uh, but also um, Scottish political economy. Um, so not, not only Adam Smith, but also James Stewart, about whom he wrote a, a manuscript, which, which has now been lost. People hope that it will still be discovered. So he's interested in political economy, 
um, and therefore interna the processes of international uh, commerce and, I suppose, early stage proto-industrialization. Uh, broadly speaking, he was in favor of the advance of uh, commercial processes and wealth generation, but nonetheless thought this um, had generated uh, massive problems, uh, largely the ever-intensifying um, polarization between rich and poor. He thought what he describes as a luxury economy, which we would probably, roughly speaking, call capitalism, um, had generated vast quantities of wealth. Um, and it's indeed the case that many of the poor also became wealthier. It wasn't a, a sort of Marxist zero-sum perspective. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it is quasi Marx. I mean, Marx, well, at one remove, was a student of Hegel's. Obviously. This is a Hegel student, Edvard Gantz, taught Marx. Mm. Um, uh, so Hegel wasn't a Marxist, it goes without saying, but he, he did believe that there was this intrinsic dynamical problem within capitalism, which is that it generated immiseration and didn't generate its own cure. And Marx, of course, explicitly acknowledges his, his debt to Hegel on... He does. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, now look, we'll maybe get some m uh, more questions in, it, in, a, in a second on this, yeah. but before we do, I don't want to pass up the opportunity of having you here to talk about a very different subject, uh, and that is Northern Ireland today. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, a hundred years after uh, Northern Ireland was carved out as a new part of, uh, of Britain. Yeah. Um, the Irish Free State, of course, having em emerged in the south. Um, and it seems to me that uh, many of the problems, not all, but many of the problems were resolved in Northern Ireland by the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, only for uh, English politics, and I think I can call it English politics, to run a coach and horses through that agreement with the demand and then the success of leaving the European Union. Do you think that's a fair characterization? And, and uh, what sort of transition are we in at the moment in Northern Ireland? Because we are in a moment of transition, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident. Yes. Um, well, I think... Um, well, I was certainly a supporter of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Um, and, um, but broadly speaking, I think at the time... W w one of our problems is that at the time, there was... Um, an overly, uh, perhaps naively, um, overly enthusiastic embrace of the notion that the curtain on a whole era had now fallen and the uh, sunny uplands were now within, within sight. It was an actual fact. Um, the conflict in Northern Ireland between 1968 and 1998 um, was basically a, a civil war situation managed by... Um, the occupying forces of the British Crown, that's 30,000 troops. Um, otherwise, it would have been um, more like a situation such as you reported on um, in Central Eastern Europe um, in the 90s. There's no doubt that that would have happened. So it was a managed um, civil war with much um, nastiness and, and bitterness on, on both sides. So the idea that one is going to emerge, for, emerge from there into an agreement which is going to lead to um, um, uh, liberal democratic uh, reconciliation was overly optimistic. Uh, that's not to say um, a corner hasn't been turned. Of, of course it was. Um, the pa paramilitary, pa Northern Ireland paramilitaries have been um, dismantled. There's broadly speaking something like an embrace of, of a political process. But the idea that this was going to be an easy and happy political process was perhaps um, too much to um, expect. Um, so, um, you're implying that it's at, it's at a turning point. It's certainly, I think, a highly um, dysfunctional uh, jurisdiction within the United Kingdom. Um, that's for sure. Um, it's still got ongoing um, bitterness, ugly politics and dysfunctional politics. I'm not absolutely sure, and I should say there's experts in the room who know more about this than I do, um, but um, how exactly this is going to pan out, I don't know. Within the agreement, I mean, what's 
you know, within the, within the 1998, the 1998 agreement is, is uh, roughly, speaking, it's got many dimensions, but let's just mention two dimensions. One is an internal um, government structure for, for, for managing the business of politics. Um, that's not working very well now and hasn't worked extremely well since the get-go, though it's a whole lot better than anything that went before, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, of course, there is a mechanism for dismantling the whole jurisdiction of Northern Ireland by um, plebiscite, which is to say the existence of Northern Ireland uh, can be discontinued by a popular vote of um, 50 plus 1 percent, right? 50 uh, percent plus 1 vote. Um, so there's a principle of instability written into uh, the settlement. And... Um, Therefore, partly because of that, I mean, um, it may be that I'm overstating the importance of that, but it, it always seemed to me that that was important because there was no other alternative at the time, but nonetheless, that had built within it the capacity for struggle because, roughly speaking, one half the population, and we're talking close to a half and a half, one half the population wants the continuation of Northern Ireland, and the other population, uh, half the population um, doesn't. We could play around with those... Uh, percentages, uh, because not all Catholics want out, and, and so on and so forth. But, but it is a collision, a potential uh, collision. Uh, and, you know, whether it was in 1998 going to be in, 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 in 2016, well, well, that passed and there's no problem. Um, and it's not now, and maybe it's not the next 10 years, maybe it's not the next 15 years, maybe not the next 20. But there is a demographic shift, there's no doubt about that. And therefore, there's a from one part of the population's perspective, an ongoing threat. So anything else which tampers with the domestic situation, like, like, like Brexit, which seems to be awarding a victory to one side, because it's sort of tampering with the border, that's basically the fear, um, uh, that is highly destabilizing. So even if to the rationally minded, it doesn't really matter uh, tuppence, whether there's um, a minor trade border at some port somewhere in Northern Ireland. Nonetheless, this um, conjures up the prospect of the disintegration of the regime, which is the disappearance of the raison d'etre of 50% um, of the population, 20% uh, of which are very angry and have never had a victory since 1912 or 1920. Um, so it's a kind of lose-lose-lose-lose uh, process for Northern Ireland's Protestants. They've got um, a very poor um, political class. I don't representation. Mean, well, I yeah. think so. Yeah. I mean, no leadership, no vision. Yeah. I mean, what's the point? What's the meaning of unionism? I mean, the, you know, what we have, we hold. We really want to keep this. Uh, no matter what, what is it? We don't really know. You know, yeah. um, I'm sorry, I'm sounding, uh, you know, critical. Well, I am critical, but only because people in my generation um, in the South uh, were brought up to be sympathetic to the unionist predicament. But um, um, it's been unproductive since the settlement and has set itself up for failure again and again and again, Brexit just being one more example, it seems to me. Uh, terrific, Richard. If anyone else is interested in this subject, by the way, can I highly recommend a, a series on BBC television called Once Upon a Time in Northern Ireland, which I just finished watching this week. It's an absolutely shattering experience, but uh, really does conjure up uh, the depth of uh, distress that this conflict um, generated. Uh, and if you don't know how to get BBC on I iPlayer, I can tell you afterwards by using a VPN. Um, uh, so, uh, can we go to the audience, please? Questions about Hegel, 1989, French Revolution, Northern Ireland, whatever you choose. Um, lady at the, in the middle there. Thank you very much. I would like to know how you are comparing Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, with Cousteau, the famous French aristocrat who traveled through Russia at the same time Alexis de Tocqueville was writing his work. Uh, Cousteau came back from Russia and said that the raison d'etre of Russia forever will be based on three entities, the boot, the whip, and the lie. And this is probably going to have a cleavage between the West and the East. 
and he wrote this in the 18th century. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, um, to Constance of a younger generation, um, uh, to talk, Phil, they're both obviously children of the, of the French um, Revolution. Uh, one of them, interestingly, a Protestant. Um, and, um, you know, they lived through its failures and were interested in um, developing ways of, um, um, you know, resettling um, the explosion, um, repacifying the explosion, containing the explosion that had happened in um, 1989, believing that uh, democracy was an inescapable force in modern history, but also a dangerous force. So in a way, they're both representative of the, the, the point that I was making earlier, that um, democracies are constitutional democracies, and there's a democratic component, but also a constitutional component. And how these are combined is obviously a complex discussion. And um, France went through um, many um, models of potential, potential possible um, settlements down to you know the 1850s when Toffer was still um, writing about it. So yes, they both would have seen themselves as part of um, modernizing, constitutionalizing Europe by comparison with, with Russia, um, as you say. I mean, Russia looked like a, a back, backwards man, a backwards man, a um, uh, um, sort of pure body. I mean, it had a slave culture apart from anything else. That's to say, a huge section of the peasantry were, were peasant slaves. Um, it, had, uh, it was an unregulated empire. Um, it, had, um, um, an, it was administered by an unaccountable executive power. Um, uh, but obviously, it wasn't condemned to be thus ever, and there were, were reforming forces in the early 20th century. So it wasn't the, wasn't the, wasn't the whip potentially for, for, forever. Um, but obviously, um, you know, the, 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 the Russian Revolution itself uh, was not a straightforward affair and ended up evolving into its own form of dictatorship. But I, I don't know that I want to say um, uh, that Russia would have been condemned to that. And Russia today is nowhere near um, early 19th century Russia, which was, um, you know, by, 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 by all accounts, um, you know, by anyone's standards, or by our standards, let's just say, uh, pretty much a, a social and, and constitutional abomination. But I'm interested in both those figures, Constant and Tocqueville, so thanks for that question. Yeah. Finton, were you going to? I guess. Um, um, I wonder, thinking about, about Hegel and his relationship to Kant and to universalism, you were talking about this idea that there's been this breakthrough to think about universal humanity. Mm. And I wonder how mm. that plays out for Hegel in relation to colonialism and in relation to the development of the, the, the resorting of humanity, in fact, into dominant and, and inferior peoples, uh, and, and how you see that tension within the Enlightenment project playing out subsequently, because it, it seems to still be there as one of the drivers of identity politics today and, and of the critique of the Enlightenment, which will become very fashionable in the 1970s. Uh, just your sense of where all that lies would be, would be really interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks, Fintan. Um, well, colonialism is already complicated because it means, in, in our contemporary conversation, two things. Either uh, European imperial structures um, or um, European um, imperial structures with colonial populations. Colonial populations meaning uh, populations which were settled in new um, jurisdictions. Um, Australia, South Africa, America. These, uh, I mean, in Hegel's era, these are called colonial. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is not called colonial. Uh, and indeed, India is not called colonial. Because uh, colonial is, you know, it's from the Latin, colere. You know, the, the soldiers went out, they settled, and they cultivated the earth. It's, a, it's an empire of farmer settlers. And obviously, the the British thing under Elizabeth and James, um, beginning with Ireland, um, started there as colonial settlers. But these co colonial settlers um, were not intended to be 
uh, slave subjects or even second-class citizens. So colonialism, from that point of view, is the spread, in theory, of, um, of um, a sort of universalism, um, which um, did not entail the organization of the world's population to different stratifications. Um, so that's point number one. However, uh, there were also empires which involved um, structures of governance which were unaccountable, and therefore the populations under those governments had um, lesser rights uh, than the populations of Europe. So uh, South Asia is the best example, um, which is, say, India. Um, but Indians were not slaves under the British Empire, uh, and for most of its, um, well, you know, the, Indi the Indian story is a complicated one. India itself doesn't really have a revisionist history. Um, it's got its liberation from colonial rule story. I mean, Ireland has a revisionist history. India doesn't have an equivalent because it didn't have, wasn't shaken into it by, you know, late 20th century um, conflicts. So, um, so it's got a rather na naive view of enslavement and liberation. But this never happened because India was already the product of five waves of Islamic conquest by the times the, the British ever arrived. And um, was the uh, Mughal Empire a pretty thing under which to live? Who introduced caste structures, the Indians or the British? Well, obviously, uh, they pre-exist the British. So um, empire and colonialism didn't quite do that. So the contemporary, broadly speaking, anti-Hegelian, actually, post-colonial hysteria, I would say, around all this, much of it is just based on um, um, A, inaccuracies, and B, a sort of agitated, agitated um, uh, will to um, you know, despise the West. Um, which is part of sort of um, university culture amongst um, privileged young people. So it's a very interestingly uh, identifiable ideology. It's not, nothing to do with people in India, India. It's nothing to do with people in Africa. It's to do with people in Yale or Princeton. Um, uh, so this is their vision, which is informed by their alarm about ongoing problematic race relations in the United States. So it's a rather smorgasbord sort of um, ideology, um, and I think it could do with an, an injection of accuracy. Uh, that's not to say the British, the, the European empires, uh, that's not to say that their labor was a great thing, but just that it's more complicated, as you, as you would be the first to know, you know it was, as we had to find out. It was just a bit more um, complicated. Um, so that would be my, my short, slightly controversial answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Daniel, did you want to ask a question? Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed how you took some of the challenges we see as very new and contextualized them and showed that actually, well, they're being here in the history of democracy for a very long time. Mm. But I was wondering if maybe we are living a crisis of a very particular institution, and that is the political party. Because in the story that you told, I kind of had the feeling that one can see the rise and the fall of this institution from a moment in which people we now read as liberals or proto-liberals were very skeptical of mass democracy and came to terms to it through political parties to a moment of eclipse, be that in the 1990s, right now. So I was wondering if you can talk more about that and how it fits in this overall picture. Yes, crisis of party where? Um, do you mean that um, the parties on the, on the horizon are problematic or that the very institution of uh, party government is declining? More than that, I mean, I mean more how maybe for a generation of liberals, parties came to be the only medium acceptable to engage in mass politics, as you said, but now even that idea, that vehicle for mass politics is so discredited in many quarters, intellectually, politically, that there's less excitement about the Yes. The yes. I, th I think I have very ambivalent views about parties. That's to say, um, uh, politically, I, 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 you know, um, theoretically, I, I, I support them. I support the existence of, of parties and the alteration of, of party. Um, I, I'm very alarmed by the extent to which um, journalism and academia, uh, the commentariat, uh, the world of opinion, um, has also become um, in its own mind, unproblematically party-aligned. 
So I'm a bit of a skeptic about the very notion of, of left and right. I, I don't really know what these things mean over you know, a medium term durée. Um, but the obsession to align oneself with one of these is more intense now in universities and the media than it was, say, in, in, the, in, the, in the 90s or 80s. Um, and I think that's rather worrying. So I'm, I'm anti-party. Um, for um, uh, intellectual life. I, I'm pro-party for, um, you know, institutional life. And it must be there because they, they modify each other, they challenge each other, they mutually regulate, um, and they're therefore, as, a, um, as, a combustible, as combustible energies, um, they are mutually modifying and moderating. Um, so that to me, seems to me constitutely a, a good thing. I hadn't particularly thought that their, their day is up. Uh, I mean, they're going strong in the United States. They're going strong in... I mean, there are new forces and the possibility of, of new parties, but um, they're still mostly minority parties who don't look set to me to o overturn... Um, of course, Europe's a bit different from the United States and Britain just because of multiple party structures and two party structures, and it's debatable which is preferable, multi party structures or two party structures. Uh, and I don't have a hard and fast answer there. But I wouldn't have thought the day of the party is over. I rather hope not. Um, that they're problematic. I mean, part, you know, parties didn't emerge with the French Revolution or the English Civil War, uh, they didn't actually exist then as organizationally as structures. You know, there were ideological parties, but they weren't institutional parties. They emerge really with mass democracy as a, as a way, that's what you've implied, as a way of managing an expansion of the electorate in the last 19th century, late 19th century. I mean, how do you manage this massive injection of um, um, uh, population into the political process? And um, the only way it seemed was by means of platforms which required parties and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, I've, I've ten, you know, in the late 19th century, some people thought this was an appalling corruption of democracy because, uh, after all, it's the party was setting the agenda rather than the population. Um, but I've rather thought, uh, I've been pro-party, except in the sense in which I said, that's to say, I, do, I don't understand mm. why my colleagues are so anxious to display their affiliations in the ways that 17-year-old students are. <laughs> um, Richard, I'm going to yeah. stop you there to get a last question in before, unfortunately, we have to wind up. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Professor Burke, I'd, I'd like to hear your, your opinion on the situation of democracies in Central and Eastern Europe, referring to what you said about um, the constitutional powers and the uh, popular powers. Yeah. Where do you see such uh, countries uh, like uh, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, Slovakia, maybe they are voting tomorrow? Uh, because in my opinion, some of these countries are moving away <coughs> from the <coughs> so-called Verfassungspatriotismus, Habermas, and moving towards a nationalism, a populist nationalism. Thank you. Just a point of information, they're voting today in Slovakia. Yes. Well, I, I, I'm attempting to an, a, answer this question next to an expert, so I, I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the person to ask, but I, I, I agree that the decline... I mean, I'm not sure, but I think you can use the phrase for Fassung's patriotismus without being a Habermasian. So, I, 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 so let's just call it, um, you know, uh, a constitutional regime. Um, I, I agree that um, constitutional regimes are under threat by um, um, popular bigotries in Central Europe. I mean, it's not just that it, they're popular, it's that they're mobilized populations. And um, you can mobilize populations um, most easily by telling them it's easy to make them rich or by telling them that there's something easy to hate. So, um, uh, so uh, that's indeed going on, uh, and it's, it's very alarming. Um, and it's not just Central Europe, but this is this is a possibility within within all constitutional democracies, as I started off by saying. So it's it's worrying, but also the, the game's not over yet. Uh, you know, 
Uh, these haven't imploded, you know, th throughout the 19th... I mean, populism in, in the 19th century used to be, actually be called imperialismus. Um, that was the original phrase, re referring to um, Napoleon III. Um, uh, that's to say, um, popular, strongly... Or Caesarism was the subsequent. So, originally, imperialismus and uh, Caesarismus. Um, and the idea was actually... Um, that um, there could be proletarian leaders um, who would appeal to the worst instincts of, of populations, um, achieve power, and abolish all constitutionalism. So this is around since 1851 as a phenomenon. Um, and even in 1851, they were looking back to other... Um, 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 Marius... Uh, Cromwell, in other words, generals who rose on a tide of popular acclamation. Um, so are we with a genuine Caesarism in um, Central Eastern Europe? Well, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. Apart from anything else, the costs of, of ejecting from the European Union will, will be very high, and um, Hungary and Poland will be slow to do that. So there will be nastiness and bigotry, um, uh, um, ho hopefully not endlessly, but, but these are genuine forces, I agree, and it's, um, that's not very pleasant, but I don't think that's um, anywhere close to, um, you know, fascism. We shouldn't be re misusing fascism. Richard, thank you very much. One of the frustrating uh, aspects of uh, festivals like the Vienna Humanities Festival is, is that one ends up spending a lot of money on books and they all pile up by your, your bedside. And I fear, um, although we don't have copies of it here, uh, I'm going to have to be purchasing your book on Hegel very soon, published on October the 31st by Princeton. University Press for those who are interested in. But in the meanwhile, we can at least thank you for an absolutely fascinating and very, very clear talk uh, uh, opening the festival. Richard Burke, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.